Good morning, and welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. This is an exciting day for the department. This is the first of the uh, Chair's Distinguished Speaker Series, better known as our Dream Speaker um, Series, where as a reward in part for our Chief Residents, who get the privilege of giving Grand Rounds, they also get to choose a Grand Round Speaker. And this year, Jeff Lynn, who is going on to cardiology training at Stanford, uh, next year uh, selected Dr. William Stevenson. Um, I was delighted by this choice because I've known Bill for years and uh, looked forward to welcoming here, him here to Madison, which f turned out to be his first visit to Madison. Uh, Dr. Stevenson received his BA in chemistry from the University of South Florida in Tampa, and then his MD with a AOA honors from Tulane before going to UCLA for internship residency, chief residency, and fellowship in cardiology. He uh, went to the Netherlands with Hein Wellens for a period of time to learn uh, more in advanced electrophysiology skills and joined the faculty at UCLA where he rose uh, through the ranks to the to, uh, associate professor level and then was recruited by Harvard um, and uh, joined the faculty at Harvard where he is now the, a professor and director of the Cardiac Arrhythmia Program. Uh, Dr. Stevenson along the way in, in, at UCLA and subsequently has really been a, uh, a leader in the field of cardiac electrophysiology and, and in some uh, experiments that are really core curriculum for anybody who studies arrhythmias using single catheter identified ways of, of identifying whether your catheter was in the loop, the reentrant loop of a ventricular tachycardia, and this set the stage for early success in cardiac ablation. He's published broadly, I counted somewhere near 350 publications when you include all the original manuscripts, editorials, and guidelines, and I always like to see how people started off, and indeed his first paper ever was in, new, was in the American Heart Journal, in 83, uh, writing about uh, control of sudden recurrent death with amiodarone. So he, is, he has been focused, if nothing else, throughout his career. Uh, he's also been well supported by various different uh, avenues and currently is on the steering co committee for Cabana, which is a large randomized trial looking at catheter ablation for AFib. He's also on a ventricular arrhythmia uh, randomized multicenter trial. He's an active clinician and is actually in the lab four or five days a week, uh, still performing uh, over 200 EP studies uh, a year. And these are typically sent to him by other electrophysiologists who can't get the VT. And they send them to Bill Stevenson, who has an amazing uh, track record of, uh, of curing and successfully ablating arrhythmias that others are unable to treat. He's a member of all the major organizations and has held uh, leadership positions with the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, the Heart Rhythm Society, the Heart Failure Society of America, and he's past president of the Cardiac EP Society. He's also a very good citizen in other ways, reviewing from many journals. He's an associate editor for circulation and editor-in-chief for circulation, arrhythmia, and electrophysiology. Uh, he's also a, a teacher. He won Teacher of the Year awards twice uh, at UCLA and uh, was presented with the Distinguished Teacher Award, the Golden Lion Lionel Award, by the Venice Arrhythmia Meeting in 2015. Uh, speaking of meetings, he speaks widely and internationally as well as nationally. He's held a number of visiting professorships. Uh, he's never been a dream speaker before, though. So uh, with that, it's really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stevenson as he presents Grand Rounds entitled, Heart Scars, Sudden Death is Now a Chronic Disease. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rick. That was a very kind introduction. It's really such a pleasure for me to be here. With, uh, I have many longstanding colleagues, uh, Lee Eckert and uh, Mike Field and, uh, of course, Rick for many many years, and I've really been very fortunate in, in my career, as you, as you just heard. So we're going to talk about ventricular arrhythmias today, and I take a pretty EKG-focused approach to, uh, to ventricular arrhythmias. So we're going to talk about monomorphic VTs, and a VT is monomorphic when the QRS complex is the same from beat to beat to beat. 
Now that tells you that the ventricular activation sequence of the heart is the same from beat to beat. So if you get good at interpreting the electrocardiogram, you can tell where that ventricular arrhythmia likely comes from, and that informs you about what the likely underlying heart disease is, and uh, also often what some of the treatment options are. Polymorphic ventricular tachycardias have a discernible QRS complex, but it's varying from beat to beat. That tells you that the ventricular activation sequence is changing continuously. And these arrhythmias don't have to have a structural substrate or a focus from which to originate, and that uh, uh, puts them into a different category and a, num a number of different causes that can cause those arrhythmias. And then the last that we won't talk about much are the sinusoidal VTs, so-called ventricular flutter. And these have an appearance of uh, a sinusoidal sort of ECG because the duration of depolarization of the heart, the QRS duration, is about the same as the time it takes to repolarize the heart. Um, and you can see this if it, with anything that slows conduction through the myocardium, so hyperkalemia or antirrhythmic drug toxicity being the two most common things. Well, um, how does one get this, these polymorphic uh, VTs in a heart that doesn't have a structural abnormality? And one of the ways is probably through spiral wave reentry. And any excitable medium can be made to have this sort of reentry um, sequence that forms a spiral like a little tornado in the heart. And if you simulate that in a two dimensional sheet, it looks something like this. You get an area where the wave front initially blocks and that allows for it to uh, spin around that initial area of block and re-enter. Now, if this happens in the anatomically uh, complex three-dimensional heart, you get something like I'm going to show you here, where this red area is the uh, excitation wave front. And so there it goes. And now it's going, these little wave fronts are going to encounter the uh, anatomic heterogeneities throughout the myocardium and fractionate and give rise into little daughter wavelets. And you can imagine that this can be a mechanism for, uh, for ventricular fibrillation. And so this is one of the mechanisms for polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation. You can get this in a structurally normal heart, uh, somebody that doesn't have any underlying structural heart disease. Well, the most common cause of this is uh, acute myocardial ischemia. The second most common cause of polymorphic VT that you're likely to encounter is the polymorphic VT that's associated with QT prolongation that we often refer to as torsade de point. And anything that prolongs the QT interval can cause this arrhythmia. So long-standing bradycardia can do it. And in fact, in the, in the old days before pacemakers, which is believe it or not, even before my time, um, some of the ways that people uh, died were not bradycardia asystole, but they had bradycardia for a long period of time. Their QT interval gradually prolonged. Eventually, they had polymorphic VT and uh, VF. Hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia can do it, and then a very large number of drugs. And uh, you'd expect some of the antiarrhythmic drugs that block potassium channels and prolong the action potential duration and therefore the QT interval could do it. But it's important to recognize that there are a number of drugs that are given for other purposes that can also do this. Notably, a number of psychotropic agents, uh, haloperidol when given in high doses in the ICU, phenothiazines, uh, some antibiotics, erythromycin, pentamidine, uh, Bactrim can do it. And then importantly, uh, methadone, there's a metabolite of methadone that's a potassium channel blocker and can do this. And more recently, we've also become uh, aware that lopiramide, um, right, which is um, imodium, when used in very high doses, as has been pop become popular in some uh, opiate uh, addict communities uh, to treat the symptoms of uh, opiate withdrawal can cause QT prolongation in uh, torsade de point, and we've seen, we're now seeing several cases every year of that. Now, another group of disorders that can lead to polymorphic ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation are those disorders that are associated with abnormalities of the heart's electrical system um, 
that are not associated with structural heart disease. And most of these have a genetic basis. So it's the congenital long QT syndrome. There are other congenital syndromes that affect cardiac repolarization. There's a short QT syndrome um, and also catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, which is a, a, generally an abnormality of cellular calcium handling in the heart. These all produce polymorphic ventricular arrhythmias uh, that can present as sudden death that are not associated with, with structural heart disease. And then the Brugada syndrome, uh, which is also associated with polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, um, that is often, uh, as we're now finding out, is fairly often associated with little areas of scarring of the right ventricle that are just below the detection limit of our standard imaging uh, techniques. So with those concerns in mind, let me show you a case. So this was a woman from a few years ago, a 54-year-old uh, woman who had a cardiac arrest while driving. And uh, she was uh, resuscitated from that event, had a normal ECG, normal echo, normal MRI, unremarkable exercise test, and an ICD was implanted. And then she had recurrent ICD shocks and was referred to us for uh, an attempt at, at catheter ablation. So this is her 12-lead electrocardiogram, and based on the things that we just reviewed, so you're, you're thinking, well, structurally normal heart, cardiac arrest, you know, you want to scrutinize the electrocardiogram for any of those factors associated with abnormal cardiac repolarization. Is there a QT interval prolongation here? No. Is there a short QT interval? No. Is it a Brigada syndrome? Well, it doesn't look like it. The ST segments in the anterior precordium are, are um, not elevated. Well, let's look at what her defibrillator is, is seeing. And the, the implanted defibrillators record the electrical signals that they see from that right ventricular lead. And this is one of her events. And this is what the right ventricular activation looks like. So it's not a QRS complex. But you can appreciate that there's a fair amount of variability in the intervals between the uh, activation. And there's also variability in their appearance, in their amplitude. This is what a polymorphic VT looks like to a defibrillator. So she's having episodes of polymorphic VT, but the EKG hasn't given us a clue about what this might be. Well, she was admitted to the telemetry service, and she was on a beta blocker that we were holding, um, thinking we would take her to the EP lab and see if we could sort out what this, what this might be. And that evening, she had an episode of anxiety and chest pain and palpitations. And this is our telemetry monitor, which just looks awful. You can't tell anything from this. But you get the idea that maybe she's having bursts of arrhythmias. And they went in and hooked her up to um, the EKG, and everything had resolved. Then the next day, she did it again. And this time, they got this. So what do you make of that? Well, this isn't like her, surf her initial EKG, is it? She's got marked ST segment elevation. And it's not the ST segment elevation you see in the anterior precordium with Brugada syndrome. This is looks like an acute inferior wall myocardial infarction. And with a little nitroglycerin, it's gone. And she was having coronary spasm. And this had gone undiagnosed because once she had the defibrillator in place, whenever the def she had an episode, she would complain of chest pain. And they said, well, you just got shocked from your defibrillator. Of course you have chest pain, but in fact, she had a right coronary lesion that was uh, stented. So that type of polymorphic VT that's related to acute ischemia or infarction is actually the most common cause of polymorphic VT, VF, that you're likely to encounter. And it's probably the most common cause of sudden death in the U.S., polymorphic VT due to acute ischemia. And uh, this occurs in about... 6% uh, or so of all acute ST segment elevation myocardial uh, infarcts. It's, uh, uh, it's often associated with, uh, with um, the first infarct. So it can be the first manifestation of coronary artery disease in about 50% of patients with coronary disease, unfortunately. And um, there are some differences between people that have VF during their infarct and those that don't. So the first thing is that they tend to have a worse in-hospital mortality. So if somebody has an infarct, VF gets resuscitated from the VF and is admitted to hospital, 
the 30-day mortality is substantially higher than the people that don't have VF. And if they have the arrhythmia more than 48 hours after the infarct, the mortality is very high. And that's because these are often the people with big infarcts who are in cardiogenic shock. But interestingly, once they survive that 30-day phase and make it out of the hospital, their risk of sudden death over the next year is no higher than the patient with the acute infarct who didn't have VF. And that's been shown in many uh, studies now with pretty long-term follow-up. So it's often one event. Um, and then once you get them through that, the prognosis is really determined by the size of the infarct and the severity of their coronary disease, not by whether they had uh, a VF episode or not. And this is important because those of us on the EP service are often consulted about a patient that has an infarct, had VF, now they're ready to go home. Do they need an implanted defibrillator to protect them from other future episodes? And the answer usually is no. Um, if it was an episode, it was just during the acute infarct period. So to summarize that, v, uh, VF occurs in 6 to 10% of STEMI uh, patients, uh, patients with ST segment elevation infarcts. Fewer non-STEMI patients uh, have ischemic uh, arrhythmias of this nature uh, in the range of a couple percent. Uh, it's associated with greater in-hospital mortality, but for those who survive, to, uh, to discharge, it's not associated with an increased risk of sudden death. Now that's different for the patients that have monomorphic VT. And we talked uh, earlier that about monomorphic VT indicating that you've got repetitive activation of the ventricle in the same way from beat to beat, and that's associated with some structural abnormality or a focus. So if an infarct patient has monomorphic VT, it usually means that they've got a scar from an old infarct. And even if then they're, they're in the midst of a new infarct, the VT is probably a sign that the scar was there from before. And those infarct scars that give rise to VT are relatively stable and robust. So this is what's going on with an infarct scar that causes VT. This is a cross-section of the heart from a patient that, that had recurrent VT. The white areas are dense collagenous fibrous tissue. And what happens in these scars is that there will be regions of surviving myocardium, the red areas through here, that create potential channels for reentry. And so this is an anatomically determined to some extent reentry circuit. And the myocardium that survives in and around that scar is relatively normal. Electrically, it's very often relatively normal. Uh, well, after a chronic, um, after the infarct is in its chronic phase. So these reentry circuits are um, very stable. You can take this patient to the electrophysiology laboratory today, tomorrow, a month from now, and usually you can still induce the ventricular tachycardia and expose the fact that there's this reentry circuit in the scar that's just waiting for the right thing to come along to, um, to go. That explains why these people can have episodes of recurrent VT over years, why if they get a defibrillator, they may have a defibrillator shock one day and then go for months without. And it may also contribute to the disappointing efficacy that we've had with antiarrhythmic drug therapy for suppressing these arrhythmias. As it's hard to give enough drug that modifies the electrical properties of these relatively normal myocytes in and adjacent to the scar without poisoning a lot of the tissue outside the um, the scar. So that then brings us to the patient who uh, is at risk for sudden death after an infarct. And uh, so some of the patients who have an acute MI will go on to form an arrhythmogenic scar and uh, be at risk for this type of ventricular tachycardia. And others have relatively small scars. Well, how do you identify who that, uh, who that might be, and is there anything we can do to protect them? Well, the risk of sudden death after an acute infarct is greatest in the first uh, three to six months, and then it declines. And that's, this is the instantaneous, or the monthly risk, I should say, of sudden death. This is from a, um, an old, uh, the Valiant trial from a few years ago. 
And the orange line here are infarct survivors who have depressed ventricular function with EF less than 30%. And then these are the better ventricular function uh, patients. And you can see that the highest risk is in the people with the worst left ventricular ejection fraction. The risk is highest in the first three to six months, and then it gradually, uh, gradually declines. So you would think that what we should do then is take the people who have a big infarct, an EF that's depressed, and give them a defibrillator after their infarct. And that was done in a couple of trials, and surprisingly, it didn't make a difference. It didn't improve survival. Um, so this is the mortality curve, and this is a trial that took people who had recent infarct, EFs less than 40%, and also had some other markers that we thought indicated electrical instability. So these ought to be high-risk people. Randomized, defibrillator, no defibrillator, and there was no difference in the mortality. Well, why is that? Because you know, defibrillators are very effective at terminating ventricular arrhythmias, and some clue as to perhaps part of the explanation comes from this observation. This is a pathology study of sudden deaths uh, in patients who uh, had had a recent myocardial infarction, and what you see is that the folks who die suddenly within a month very often have some uh, anatomic reason that caused the death rather than an arrhythmia. So it's a late myocardial rupture or, or reinfarction very often in those people, and a defibrillator is not going to, to help that. And it's not until you're out past about three months or so where the autopsy doesn't find any structural abnormality in, in the people that die suddenly, suggesting that it was a cardiac, uh, cardiac arrhythmia. So that complicates our uh, selection of um, and our attempts to protect people with an infarct after their, um, uh, after their, in, uh, their myocardial infarct, infarction. So who needs an ICD after an MI? Well, um, the, there are a number of um, uh, tests that have been studied over the years to try and identify people who are at greatest risk of arrhythmias. And all of these tests have good physiologic basis. Uh, there's good biologic plausibility that these things ought to identify people at risk for sudden death. But unfortunately, except for just the left ventricular ejection fraction, we don't have any data that supports the clinical utility of any of these tests for selecting people to get defibrillators. Um, and part of this also is related to the gratifying success that we've seen of acute uh, management of myocardial infarction with early percutaneous coronary intervention that's, that's having a favorable impact on, uh, on mortality. So sudden death rates are falling. But there is a little bit of interesting information that, uh, that I want to share with you about um, uh, EP studies and programmed stimulation. So this is how Dr. Page and I first got into electrophysiology. This was kind of your day. Right, you did this sort of testing. So this is a tracing from the EP lab, and here we're pacing. We have a temporary pacing catheter in the ventricle. We're pacing and putting in premature beats. And in this case, after three premature beats, that initiates this rhythm, which is monomorphic ventricular tachycardia over here. So this patient has a reentry circuit in their scar. And over the years, there's been waxing and waning uh, enthusiasm for attempts to use this to identify people at risk. And the, the group that has, uh, has probably the, the contributed the, the most to this is a group in Westmead, Australia, where for the past 20 years, everybody who survives an infarct and has an EF less than 40% is offered an EP study before they go home, typically at day five or so. And so they, a, a couple of years ago, they published this data. They had 730 infarct survivors, all of whom had had percutaneous myocardial revascularization. So they had um, angioplasty stenting uh, for their acute infarct. Of those people, 80% had preserved ventricular function with an EF above uh, 40%. 20% had depressed ventricular function, and they offered an EP study to those folks to see if they had inducible VT. The EP study was done at that time at an average of nine days after the infarct. They found no inducible VT in 72%, and 23% had inducible VT. 
Of the ones without inducible VT, even though their EF was low, the one-year mortality was 3%, and there was no sudden death, so uh, quite a good outcome. Of the folks that had inducible VT, they offered a defibrillator to all of the ones that had inducible VT. And by one year, 19% uh, of them had had a spontaneous episode of VT detected by their defibrillator. Now, it's always hard to know. Maybe that would have been a non-sustained episode that would have stopped by itself if they hadn't had the defibrillator. But it suggests that the inducible VT present very early after the infarct uh, predicted uh, the late occurrence of VT, suggesting that those anatomic reentry circuits start forming. The substrate is there very early after the, uh, after the infarct. But overall, it's only about 6% of people with an ST segment elevation infarct that wind up having inducible VT, a very small percentage. And again, this gets to the success of uh, acute management of myocardial infarction. But it also suggests something else interesting, which is that how is it that somebody can have an anatomic reentry circuit, can have a scar, and go for such a long time without having any spontaneous VT? And the median time to occurrence of spontaneous VT in that post-infarct group was 11 months. Well, one of the ways of thinking about that, one of the potential ways that that can happen, is uh, illustrated here. So here we've got our infarct scar, and there's a potential channel that could lead to, um, to reentrant ventricular tachycardia. And what's happening during sinus rhythm is a wave front propagates over to that area and enters the channel from both sides, collides in the middle, and nothing happens. And this is happening beat to beat. In order for the patient to have reentry, what has to happen is the wave front has to encounter block at one end of the channel. And at the other end of the channel, the wavefront has to enter, and then it has to take enough time to go from that entry region down to the area of block so that this area here has recovered by the time the wavefront arrives. And if that happens, then it will emerge, and now you have the reentry circuit. So that slow conduction that allows enough time for recovery of that region of block is really important to allow reentry to occur, and it makes it more easy to induce reentry. Well, I told you that the cells that survive in these infarcts are relatively normal, so how is it that conduction is slowed through here? And it's slowed, again, because of an anatomic reason, it appears in many cases. And this is a cross-section through a portion of, of damaged myocardium um, in a study that was done years ago by Jacques de Bacher, <coughs> who characterized propagation through these areas. And what you see is there are myocyte bundles that are separated by fibrous tissue. And although conduction through the individual cells is relatively normal, um, because they're separated by the fibrous tissue, uh, the conduction path is forced in this circuitous manner to take a uh, back and forth, a zigzag sort of pattern through the scar so that although the distance from point A here to point B is relatively short, the distance traveled by the propagating wavefront was really quite long and it took a long time to get through that scar. So that's part of it. Part of it is that slow conduction. There's another kind of electrically interesting thing that happens that's related to something that called a source sink considerations. And that is, if here's our myocyte, and our myocyte is electrically active and it's, hyper, it's uh, uh, hyperpolarized in its resting state, this tissue has to provide enough current to the patch of membrane next to it to bring that patch of membrane to threshold in order to elicit a propagated response. So the tissue that depolarizes has to supply enough current to the adjacent myocardium. And if you in introduce a little bit of additional resistance between cells, you would think that that might make it harder for one cell to bring the next cell to threshold. But in fact, that's not what happens. What happens is the um, current kind of builds up, if you will, on, on, this, on the initial side of depolarization until it reaches a critical uh, level at which it spills over to the to the next cell and brings that cell to threshold. And when you impose a little bit of resistance between cells, that actually makes that 
um, more stable, and that's, that's known as the safety factor for, uh, for conduction. So that sort of uh, little bit of increase in intracellular resistance actually increases the stability of slow conduction. And that resistance that's imposed between cells introduces these little step delays that you see illustrated here. So fibrosis is having an anatomic effect to slow conduction. It's having an effect to promote slowing of conduction from cell to cell. And then you look at scars like this. So this is uh, an area of surviving myocytes and fibrosis in an infarct. And you appreciate how conduction through these regions might be very slow. And there are a number of very nice studies that, um, uh, that relate the anatomic um, arrangement of the cells in scars to slow conduction uh, in, these, in these areas. And then there's something else that happens as well, and that is that if you have a small mass of fibers that's connected to a little bit bigger mass of fibers as occurs at branching points, now each of these cells has to supply a little bit more current to the adjacent cells that are in, of greater number as you reach these branching points. And that slows conduction, and it introduces a curvature to a propagating wavefront. And curvature is associated with slowing of conduction because each cell at the head of the wavefront is adjacent to a few more cells in front of it or a little bit more membrane area in front of it. And that slows conduction. So these are anatomic factors that slow conduction through these scars. Now, with that consideration, let's look at one other interesting observation from the post-MI inducible VT um, data of the Westmead group. So I told you that it was a median of about 11 months after the infarct before people uh, tended to present with their VT, even though you could show that they had a potential reentry circuit present in their scar nine days after the infarct. Let's look at what the VTs looked like. Well, early after the infarct, most of what they induced was very fast, 270 beats a minute. Late after the infarct, when, it, when the VT occurred, the average rate of the VT was much slower, 164 beats per minute. So what happened? Something happened that slowed conduction further through that infarct scar, and that's when the reentry circuit was able to finally be engaged by the mechanisms that could initiate reentry, um, and then they had their VT. So what happened during that time is a part of cardiac remodeling. And we're used to thinking of somebody gets an injury to their myocardium, their heart remodels. And we're used to thinking of that in kind of echocardiographic terms, where remodeling is the, the ventricle becomes uh, larger and more spherical. But there is also electrical remodeling. And in these areas of scar, there's uh, quite a lot of metabol metabolic activity present. And fibroblasts are transforming into myofibroblasts. Myofibroblasts are synthesizing collagen and matrix metalloproteinases, which are degrading the collagen. And this is an active process that's ongoing. And from the considerations that we've just discussed about the anatomy of these scars and reentry and slow conduction, you can appreciate how this kind of a process then could potentially modify conduction through scars, slow conduction, and promote the occurrence of reentry. Now, we probably modify this process by our acute interventions with the, the infarct, specifically by reperfusing the infarct. And in the EP lab, we see, uh, we see some evidence of, of that as well. So this is um, this kind of funny looking image. This is a left ventricle that's a map of the ventricle that was constructed in the EP lab by moving a catheter around the surface of the, of the ventricle. And the colors here reflect the um, amplitude of the electrical signal. So in areas where the myocardium's been replaced by fibrosis, there's no tissue to give you a signal, and you get a low amplitude signal. And in, in the normal areas, you get a high amplitude signal, and that's purple. So this heart has little areas of scar. Uh, here in, this is kind of an AP view, so this is kind of towards the apex, and this is a little bit more basal. And this is the, the heart of a patient who suffered an anterior wall infarct that was acutely reperfused. 
This is what a ventricle looks like for a patient who suffers an anterior wall infarct that's not reperfused. There's a big confluent low voltage scar that occupies the anterior wall and apex of this heart. Now, the VTs that these people get tend to be a little different. This patient tends to develop VT an average of about 10 years after their infarct. Um, whereas reperfused infarct folks usually don't show up with VT until about 15 years after their infarct. The reperfused infarct scars are smaller and the VTs are faster. The big scars, you tend to see more, uh, more slow VTs. And this is nice data from Kutch's Zuppenfeld's group in the, in the Netherlands. So the, re the, the acute therapy of the infarct also has an impact on the uh, arrhythmogenic development of the, uh, of the infarct scar. So to kind of summarize all that, there are surviving myocytes in infarcts that are the substrate for ventricular tachycardia. And you can often expose the presence of these anatomic, uh, potentially anatomic circuits uh, early after the infarct. And then as the infarct ages, the remodeling process in some people will result in slower conduction through portions of these scars and allow people to develop reentry circuits then presenting many years after their infarct with uh, ventricular tachycardia. And it's some of these considerations as well that explain in part why we, it's difficult for us to predict um, who's going to develop VT and who's not going to develop VT, although it's pretty clear there's a relationship to the infarct size. So the bigger the, the scar, the more likely they are to get in trouble. So that kind of leaves us with where we've been for a long time now in terms of defibrillators for people with an infarct uh, who we're worried might be at risk of sudden death, and that is if they've got poor ventricular function and their infarct was some time ago, or at least 40 days ago, um, then it's important to consider them for, uh, for, an implanted, uh, for an implanted defibrillator. And what the defibrillator does, of course, is it will terminate VT if they ever have it. Unfortunately, defibrillators don't do anything to prevent VT. They're a wonderful safety net, uh, but they don't do anything to prevent VT. They may terminate VT in one of two ways. They can give a shock between the uh, electrode which is sitting in the right ventricle and the pulse generator or the CAN, which is up here usually in the left infraclavicular region, or they can try and pace terminate the VT. So they can give a rapid burst of pacing from the right ventricle to try and interrupt conduction in that circuit and then stop pacing with the hope that then sinus or pace rhythm in this case uh, resumes. Antitachycardia pacing is painless and is certainly preferred. A shock is like a kick in the chest if the patient is awake for the shock. And importantly, when a patient with an infarct starts having these arrhythmias and their defibrillator starts seeing this sort of activity and terminating VT, it's a bad sign. It's a sign that that ventricle may be entering a phase of that patient's disease that's sliding downhill. Perhaps it's a sign that the have, uh, adverse sorts of anatomical re uh, remodeling and heart failure. So patients that have a defibrillator and have depressed ventricular function who then have a shock from the defibrillator have identified themselves as being, as being at increased risk for mortality over the next year and increased risk for heart failure hospitalizations. And in uh, uh, the SCUD-HEFT trial, which was a trial in which patients who had symptomatic heart failure and depressed ventricular function received, uh, were randomized to ICD amiodarone or placebo. In that trial, once the ICD patient had a defibrillator shock, um, they had a six-fold increased risk of death um, and a one-year mortality of 20% with a median time to death of six to seven months. So it identifies people as, as high risk. We don't know whether it's all just a marker when somebody starts having arrhythmias, it's just a sign their heart is sliding downhill. Or some people think there may actually be an adverse effect of these episodes of arrhythmias or defibrillator shocks on, the, um, uh, on ventricular performance. Perhaps a defibrillator shock initiates an inflammatory cascade that has some adverse effect. Um, we don't really know. We tend to think it's more, more of a marker. <laughs> 
But it's really important to get their arrhythmia under control once they start having episodes of VT or VF. And that point was made very poignantly to us a few years ago from a patient who was on our transplant list. This is a patient who had um, uh, poor ventricular function, was pretty close to getting transplant, but was still out of the hospital. And he'd had recurrent episodes of arrhythmia with recurrent ICD shocks. And when his uh, uh, time came for him to get a heart, he asked if when they took out the uh, defibrillator, if he could have the defibrillator can. So uh, the surgeon kindly gave it to him, and he took it back up to his farm in Maine and put it on a fence post and shot it. And, and then he brought it back to clinic to show us. So a bit of a love-hate relationship with the defibrillator. They're wonderful safety nets, but the shocks can have a, an important uh, negative impact on patients' quality of life. So when your defibrillator patient shows up in clinic with, uh, with an episode of arrhythmia terminated by the defibrillator, uh, it's important to consider, is this a sign that they're heading downhill? Do we need to reevaluate ischemia? Do we need to readjust medical therapy for heart failure? And then if they're having more than a rare episode of arrhythmia, um, do we need to initiate antiarrhythmic drug therapy or do we need to consider catheter ablation? Drug therapy is easy to initiate. Um, efficacy is variable. It's a bit of a trial and error kind of uh, approach. Catheter ablation is harder to initiate. You have to get uh, Dr. Field to have time in the lab to do it. Um, and it, it comes with the acute procedural risks. Well, we know that drugs can reduce the frequency of VT episodes. And this is data from a, a trial in which patients who received a defibrillator for VT or VF were randomized to amiodarone beta blocker uh, or uh, sotalol. And amiodarone um, has, as you might expect, the best efficacy in terms of reducing defibrillator shocks. But all of these therapies have some toxicities. And uh, that point uh, during long-term therapy is made pretty well by the Canadian implantable defibrillator study um, long-term follow-up. So these were patients who had, um, were resuscitated from cardiac arrest or um, hemodynamically um, significant ventricular arrhythmias, and they um, received a defibrillator uh, or uh, antiarrhythmic drug therapy with, uh, with amiodarone. And by the end of eight years of follow-up, pretty much everybody in the trial who was treated with amiodarone had either died or they'd had VT or they'd had to stop their amiodarone due to antiarrhythmic drug toxicity. So it's, it's a, a therapy that can be extremely um, helpful in individual cases, but it's usually not a long, long-term uh, strategy. So that brings us to catheter ablation, and we have a little bit more data we can uh, show about this now. The problem with catheter ablation is that, as I've shown you, this infarct scar, these circuits can be large, and it can be difficult to figure out quite where to go to interrupt them with, them, with your ablation catheter, to place a lesion to interrupt the reentry circuit. And then even if you do find a good uh, reentry path in the scar, if you repeat programmed stimulation, to, you very often find that there are multiple little circuits in there that you have to try and, uh, and address. And you may not be able to reach all of them. They can be deep within the, the myocardium. So we have a number of tools that have emerged over the past uh, 15 years or so that help with this. And so very commonly now, we uh, create very nice anatomical reconstructions of the ventricle. We can plot the cardiac electrical activity. We can define the areas of scar as these low voltage regions, which is the big red area here in this patient with a big anterior wall infarct. And we have intracardiac ultrasound, as you see here, um, that we can um, further define, refine the anatomy and watch for complications. And uh, this kind of uh, anatomic reconstructions have really facilitated the ability to identify potential reentry areas in scar and ablate those regions, even with the patient just in sinus rhythm without having to induce ventricular tachycardia, a process that's been referred to as substrate mapping. So this uh, past year, 
there was the publication of a, of a randomized trial of catheter ablation versus escalating antirhythmic drug therapy for people with VT due to an old infarct who had a defibrillator and who were on an antirhythmic drug but continuing to have episodes of VT. And this is the VANISH trial. So there were 259 people uh, uh, randomized in this trial. And um, the results uh, were favorable for catheter ablation with a, 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 the primary endpoint being a composite endpoint. But you can see that a lot of people still had ventricular tachycardia. There were just, um, the, the frequency of VT was reduced and the time to the first VT was reduced. But the thing that's kind of interesting and that, that gives us a little bit of guidance uh, for our patients, I think, is really this sub-analysis of the study. So this is the curve for people who were on amiodarone when they entered the study. And they were randomized to either get more amiodarone if they were on low, a low dose of amiodarone or to have another antirhythmic drug, mixilatine, added to the amiodarone. Those people did much better with catheter ablation. The people who were not on amiodarone were usually on another antirhythmic drug, sodalol. And the, in the drug group there, they were switched to amiodarone versus getting catheter ablation. And for them, switching to amiodarone was about the same as, to, as having a catheter ablation procedure. So it suggests that if you're failing amiodarone, you probably ought to just come to the EP lab and have an ablation. If you are having recurrent VT on a different drug, amiodarone is a reasonable option if you're willing to deal with the, the side effects and can manage the, the uh, side effects. And then there's another interesting observation in that regard which is the adverse effects of therapy during the trial. So in the drug group, there are three therapy-related deaths related to pulmonary toxicity and hepatic toxicity. And you can imagine if you have somebody who's on a modest dose of amiodarone and they get bumped up to a larger dose of amiodarone and followed, some of those people are going to have toxicity. There were no treatment-related deaths in the catheter ablation group although there was about a 6% or so procedure-related risk, as we've seen in most of the ablation trials. Now, although most people that get ablation will have at least one more episode of VT, about half of them will, the frequency of VT is very often reduced. And that's uh, uh, the point of this slide that plots from a different uh, post-marketing study of uh, structural heart disease VT. Frequency of VT episodes, each line is a patient, there are people uh, here that had more than 100 episodes of VT in the six months prior to ablation. And then after, you can see down here that there are people that had a lot of VT before and still have some after, but the frequency is reduced. Now, so far we've been talking about ischemic heart disease because that's where we know the most about scars and ventricular arrhythmias. But the same applies in many respects to non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. And we're not used to thinking of a patient with a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy as having an area of scar. But some people do get areas of replacement fibrosis that produces the same sort of scar-related reentry circuits as in the ischemic uh, heart disease population. And this is, uh, these scars are detectable with MR imaging. They're evident as areas of delayed um, hyperenhancement of gadolinium. And uh, there are a number of studies now with, uh, that show this sort of data, whereas if you take a, a large number of people with non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy, about a third of them will have areas of delayed um, hyperenhancement in their myocardium consistent with SCAR. The people that have that have a higher risk of sudden death than the patients that do not. Unfortunately, we don't have any data to this point to tell us what would happen if we gave those people defibrillators. We don't have any randomized data about how to manage those uh, patients. So we still fall back on, the, uh, on ventricular function. These people, once they have a defibrillator, well, um, if they show up with VT, we now recognize that there are certain types of VTs associated with scars in certain areas in the ventricle. And uh, now in the EP community, we're pretty good at looking at the QRS morphology of a VT and saying this VT comes from the septum, this VT comes from the lateral wall. With this one, there's a risk of heart block if we, ha if we have to ablate in that region. With this one, we might need to ablate in the epicardium. Now, how does all that relate to the sudden death problem? 
US. So there are somewhere in the range of, of 200 to 400,000 sudden deaths per year in the, uh, in the US. Most of those are probably acute ischemic events. Um, and many of those, as we mentioned, are the first presentation, sadly, of the patient's uh, underlying uh, coronary artery disease. Patients with scar-related ventricular arrhythmias, uh, depressed ventricular function, heart failure, probably about a quarter or so of the deaths and then the remainder are rare things and, and cardiomyopathies. Um, but we still need therapies to uh, prevent ventricular arrhythmias and we're seeing an increase in the need for those therapies, I think as a consequence of the very large number of people now who receive defibrillators. So uh, there are about, in the U.S., around 90,000 defibrillators implanted annually in people that didn't have a defibrillator before. And within the next three years or so, in the range of 20% of those people will experience a therapy from their device. And for many people, it's more out eight years or so after their, uh, their implant. And we're now at the point where we're seeing a lot of those people as their ventricles remodel, they get VT, and they need... Um, and they need therapy. So what's coming? So this is, of course, a few people have said this, not just Yogi. It's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Well, there's uh, been a huge amount of technical advance in the electrophysiology world over the past 15 years. It's been a, really an amazing, an amazing field. We'll show you just one of the things that's, uh, that's coming. So uh, a few groups, and this is data from the Hopkins group, are now able to take MRI images of an individual patient and create um, mathematical computer simulations of the anatomy of the ventricle and then uh, do simulations of EP studies and see if you can induce reentry related to those circuits. And then uh, their hope is to define where you would need to go to interrupt those circuits and say, okay, this person's heart has a scar here. Here's where the circuits are. You go to the EP lab and you fix that. Well, it would be nice if you didn't even have to go to the EP lab to fix it. And one of the things that we talked about last night uh, as well with Dr. Lin is that there's now been some first-in-human experience with stereotactic radio ablation for interrupting reentry circuits in scars, and essentially radiation therapy that can target areas of scar non-invasively, no catheters in, uh, in the heart. And so that uh, I think that these sorts of technologies are going to be married with the uh, uh, advances in ability to characterize um, arrhythmogenic scar non-invasively. Um, and that the invasive types of EP procedures, which right now uh, Dr. Page uh, and I grew up with, are, are hopefully, by the time we need them, are hopefully going to be a, a thing of the past for some of us. Thank you very much. Bill, I'll ask you to uh, call on the audience with any questions, and please uh, repeat the question. Questions? Yes, sir. So the question, the question is, well, thank you. I hope you're stimulated by the talk. Uh, the question is, where do stimulants, uh, um, particularly pharmacologic and supplements, come into this, um, this arrhythmia milieu? So uh, the heart is, is of course, uh, very sensitive to beta adrenergic stimulation and sympathetic stimulation. And um, any, although stimulants usually will not cause an arrhythmia if the substrate is not there. If the substrate is there, they will in, uh, very likely increase the likelihood of an arrhythmia occurring. So for somebody that has some underlying predisposition to uh, arrhythmia from any of the causes that we talked about, um, as, as many of them will identify a, a stimulant, emotional stress, um, uh, caffeine um, as uh, potential triggers for some of their arrhythmic events. That's uh, even more common in some of the idiopathic 
everything is that we didn't really discuss uh, today. So it is important in identifying those factors for patients and counseling them about that is an important aspect of uh, taking care of, of uh, these patients. Bill, the, um, you talk that this, the stereotaxic ablation is space age, but, yes. um, but can you just comment on, on the, uh, the techniques that, that you're using now for these refractory ventricular tachycardias? Specifically mentioned, you spoke about endocardial, um, epicardial, and with full disclosure that your involvement that you showed, the needle ablation technologies to, to get at areas of the reentrant circuit that you can't get from the outside or the inside of the heart. Yeah, when we fail with catheter ablation, very often it's because we can't reach the, um, the arrhythmia substrate. And you can imagine, you know, when you come through the vasculature to the heart, it takes you to the endocardium, but the heart muscle, of course, has some thickness to it that's maybe a centimeter to a couple centimeters in some areas. And uh, if the substrate is closer to the epicardial surface, then we now in the, commonly in the EP lab will enter the pericardial space even with a dry pericardium. There are techniques using either a micropuncture needle or an epidural type of needle to puncture into the pericardial space, get a wire into the space, and then a sheath into there so that you can get a catheter out to the epicardium, and that allows us to, to ablate arrhythmias that ar uh, arise from close to the sub-endocardial, sub-epicardial uh, region. Well, there's still a lot of heart muscle in between the epicardium and the endocardium, and some people have had cardiac surgery where you can't get into the pericardial space. So there are a couple of, uh, there are a few options when that's the case. If you can't fix it from the endocardium or the epicardium, you can try and do transcoronary alcohol ablation. So you can do an angiogram, see if you can identify the vascular supply to the, the uh, area that's, that's arrhythmogenic, and then have one of the talented interventional cardiologists subselectively cannulate that vessel try and confirm that making it ischemic terminates the arrhythmia and then inject alcohol, just like doing an alcohol ablation for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, to damage it. And we do that about uh, 1 to 2 percent of uh, VTs. The other um, thing that we're working on that, that, that Rick mentioned is this needle catheter. So this is a, a catheter that has a 27-gauge needle, it's very small, that you can extend out from the end of it uh, and withdraw it. And um, if you extend the needle into the tissue and deliver radio frequency electrical current to the needle, you'll make a long, skinny lesion that's as deep as the needle goes. If you irrigate the needle so that saline goes out into the tissue um, from the tip of the needle, it seems to create a virtual electrode in the tissue and you can make large, deep uh, lesions. So we started working on that about 17 years ago. It was a difficult process. Our industry partners saw this as kind of a niche orphan thing. But um, we've, three years ago, we did uh, first in man up in Halifax uh, with John Sapp. And now, th this past year, we finally got FDA permission, and we've now used it in 12 people. In Boston, we have permission for another eight, and then we'll continue on. And we've had uh, we've had some where we had not been able to fix the, the uh, to terminate the arrhythmia, and now we could we were able to terminate it. And we've had others where we thought we'd be able to, and we still couldn't. So, uh, but we're we're encouraged, and we're learning a lot about that particular technology. And the other thing that we're learning about, which was a surprise, is um, is about injecting stuff into scars in human hearts. So, you know, there's a lot of interest in that for injecting cells and biological sorts of uh, therapies. And you think, oh, we just stick the needle in and we inject the stuff, it'll distribute in there. But when we inject, we give a little bit of contrast mixed with saline, so we get to see this, how it disperses in the tissue. And it doesn't disperse in a uniform manner. You see little tissue planes, you see stuff dissect through different ways. Uh, sometimes it's really hard to inject anything in. So we're also learning a bit about that, which I think will inform therapies, uh, some of the, the, uh, the way that some biological therapies might be implemented in the future. Great. Uh, we're going to have to stop there. I do want to, uh, to thank Jeff Lynn for identifying you as a dream speaker. It's really fun to have an electrophysiologist here, Dr. Hamden, and, and, and I certainly appreciate that. And having two of your trainees, Dr. Field and Dr. Eckhart, uh, makes it especially rewarding.
Uh, I also have this plaque acknowledging your giving an outstanding grand rounds and signed by our chief residents and myself. So I know that is the only plaque you have signed by chief residents in Absolutely. your office, and, and enjoy it, and thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much.